Hi, everyone. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about generics in theory and practice. So specifically, I'm going to go through what is generic programming and how does generic programming work in Swift, what we can learn from the standard library and how it uses generics, and then what's coming in Swift 4 and beyond in generics and a little bit of else otherwise stuff. So what is generic programming? It's a paradigm that came around in the 1970s and has been used in many programming languages from Ada to Pascal to C++ to Java. And the focus on it is building code that is super reusable. Now, this isn't just your run-of-the-mill reusable, use it three or four times. This is fundamentally reusable code. And it does this by creating type-independent code. And the power of generic programming comes from that decoupling between type and implementation. Within Swift, we have generics. And a lot of the ideas about generics can be found in the generics manifesto. This is a document that came out of the Swift 3 development process and is up on GitHub for everyone to review. Now, this is a living document that discusses a lot of the ideas on how generics are going to work in Swift, what are the different features. But the first thing to know is that the generics manifesto is not a promise. Everything in there still has to be uh, proposed, still has to be discussed. And of course, there's things in there that might never actually get implemented. Thankfully, some things were implemented in Swift 3, like generic type aliases and some nice little syntactic improvements. And there have already been a bunch of proposals either put up or accepted for Swift 4 that come from the generics manifesto. Now, generics in the standard library. This is the really cool stuff because Swift, the Swift standard library was the first place to actually be able to use generics because obviously they were the first one to use Swift. So it stands to reason that we can learn from the way that the standard library authors chose to use generics. So first of all, I'm going to talk about collections, arrays, dictionaries, sets, all of those classes of items. Now, they are one of the most commonly used generic types in Swift, and that's because, well, they can hold anything. Collections don't care about what type of objects they contain. The implementation doesn't depend on different types being present, although there are certain optimizations you can make. But collections also force the people using them to make type decisions. You're creating an array of integers. You're creating a dictionary that has strings and foos, for instance. It's making everyone who uses them uh, make those decisions. Global functions are kind of new to us who came from Objective-C, where there are these overarching functions that work on pretty much anything in the Swift standard library. Um, they do things like map, filter, reduce, print, and of course, lots of transformations. Now, global functions are extremely widely applicable. So it stands to reason that they would use generics because they need placeholders. The compiler needs to know something about the types being used, so they looked to generics to do that. When it comes to transformations, most of those functions have two different generic placeholders, one for input, one for output. And if the generic global functions don't use two types, chances are there is only going to be one type constraint. And this is because, well, generics are Placeholders, they just don't have a reason for using two, and we'll get into more of that later. The one place in the Swift standard library that you'll find more than a couple generic placeholders or like a single generic type constraint is when we get into language limitations. For instance, we all know the problem that you cannot create a variable that is both a class and a protocol without specifying a concrete type. Um, this is a big pain point coming from the Objective-C world and frameworks like UIKit. And we have everyone's favorite compiler error, which is that protocols with associated types can only be used at generic constraints. Everybody loves that one. Um, these are two language limitations in Swift, problems that have been uh, discussed in detail, saying we want to fix these problems. But the reason that the standard library doesn't work around these is because the standard library is protocol oriented. There are a lot of opportunities to design with these problems in mind. And so the standard library authors were able to do that, whereas we don't have those options. But that's not to say that the standard library is perfect. There are a lot of places where, well, there's very few places where they've gone through and done some pretty interesting things. So 
please don't read this. <laughs> this is just an example. Um, this is the initializer for the mirror struct. And it was the most type constrained function that I could find in the standard library without spending like two weeks digging into it. And this is the kind of stuff that the standard library does when it starts using generics. It's either really, really simple or something like this, which is a very extreme use case. So one thing that is really consistent in the standard library is that there aren't really one-offs. You have generic protocols, you have generic types, but you don't find a sprinkling of generics here or there like you would in our own code bases. There's not one function on some non-generic type that has a type constraint. There's not one protocol that's related to a bunch of other protocols that's generic, that where the other ones are in generic. It's pretty much all generics or no generics. And of course, the exception is when language limitations are run into, because the Swift type system is new, there are known problems, so generics help solve a lot of those problems. Lastly, generics are not used to be cool. I mean, generics are a hot topic, and when Swift was announced, everyone was quick to try and figure out, why am I using generics? What are they doing? What is the purpose? Like, how am I gonna use this in my code base? And it's been really tempting for people to go and say, generics are cool, I'm gonna use them on my code base. That's great, it's a great idea. Except generics are a tool to solve a very specific set of problems. And until you understand those problems, going through and using them will often lead to more problems where you'll have um, the phrase turtles all the way down has been replaced with generics all the way down, where you're making generics that have generics that have generics that have generics and it just gets messy. So, what can we learn from what the standard library does and doesn't do? First of all, generics always have a purpose. They're either a design decision, because something like a collection can hold any kind of object, and they're specifically saying we can hold any type of kind of object, we're not making any special exceptions or special cases. Or there's a last resort when they've designed themselves into a corner and, well, the language doesn't support what we need to do, so we need to use generic type constraints in order to preserve our type safety. So when you think about adding a new generic type, generic protocol, um, even a generic function, you really want to think about what is the problem you're solving here? Do you really want to make this generic? Or are you working around a language limitation and you really need that thing that is both a class and a protocol, but not a concrete type? Creating true reusability is another core tenet of generics, and which is why so much of the standard library uses it. There's, I, I didn't actually count all of the classes and structs, that, or protocols and structs that were generic, but let me say that there are a lot of them. And so creating that true reusability does the type matter? Um, if you are building something and you find yourself making all of these little special cases, well, oh, if this object is that kind of object, this other thing, then chances are you're not actually building a generic component. And you know what? It's okay to not build generic components. Generics are super cool and everyone wants to use them, but in our day-to-day -day applications, there's gonna be a lot of code that we write that is not super reusable and that is really specific to this one instance or these two instances. And in that case, you don't need to use generics unless you're working around a language limitation. And the most important lesson that the Swift Standard Library teaches us is that generics are about surfacing and enforcing type decisions. Anytime you use a generic, you are making a type decision. Swift is a strongly typed language, so generics help the compiler understand the type decision as well as enforcing it. If you create an array of integers, you try and add a string to it, the compiler will not build. If you try and use some weird little casts to try and force your strings way into an array of integers, the runtime will fail. So. Generics enforce all of the decisions that we make. And as I said, you can work around this by using the any protocol, uh, any, not really a protocol, it's like the catch-all in Swift. But this is kind of considered poor form. Swift is a type-safe language. If you want to work in a type-safe world, using something like any is throwing type safety out the window and probably going to cause more problems than you really want to fix. So. What 
is coming soon. Now, this is the really cool stuff, because Swift is evolving. It's evolving in the open. And so we get to see the cool stuff that's coming before it's really ready. So the first is recursive protocol constraints. This is a proposal that is currently up and under review. And what does that mean? Well, when you have a generic protocol, aka a protocol with an associated type, it can now reference its enclosing type. Well, what does that mean? Well, the best example is with the sequence protocol. It's in the collection family of protocols. And one of the problems with sequence is that it has a subsequence associated type that also in reality should be a sequence. Now, right now in Swift 3, there's no way to enforce that relationship. So it's up to the implementers of the sequence protocol to ensure that whatever they're using as that subsequence is also a sequence. There's also a very, very long comment, um, which if you're using Xcode, unfortunately, those comments don't show up if you're just poking around. And this problem with sequence is actually one of the reasons that that initializer I showed you is so bad, because you end up creating super long type constraints simply because a language feature doesn't exist yet. So this is up in a, in a proposal right now for Swift 4. It's not that big of a change. Things are going really well. And another thing that this fixes is some what I call leaky abstractions. Um, so the Swift auth standard library authors did a really great job in making sure that it was a cohesive library and that things make sense. But some stuff slipped through. And if you look close enough, there are these underscore protocols um, that are related to sequences and indices and collections that are, well, you're not supposed to use them protocols, but they're stand-ins because they didn't have stuff like this. So the proposal for recursive types or in protocols gets rid of those as well and just makes the standard library a lot cleaner. Nested generics is another idea from the generics manifesto, which I personally really like, even though it's really not that fancy. This, thankfully, is only a compiler feature. So unlike a lot of the other things that have to do with generics, this won't actually change the output of the compiler. It's just the compiler needs to know that this is an acceptable thing to allow. And all this really does is make it so that you can nest your generic declarations. It doesn't seem like much, but when you start going down the path of building a truly reusable component, you're going to want to make sure that there are some internal structures that are private, and you're really going to want to nest those generics. Now, and this is the cool one. This is the one that I spent definitely the most time researching. The biggest quality of life improvement that will be coming in Swift 4 and beyond will have to do with existentials. What are existentials? I'm talking about generics. Bear with me for a second. So generics are a feature that help types get enforced at compile time. Existentials are placeholders for types that are determined at runtime. Generics compile time, existentials runtime. And these are just placeholder types. If you've ever worked in Objective-C, you've used an existential before because this is an existential. You don't actually know what concrete type this is going to be. You just know that it is a UI table view data source and a UI table view data a delegate. And that's it. You don't actually know if it's going to be a view controller, if it's going to be some random object. You don't know anything other than these two protocols that it conforms to. Now, this we can do in Swift. In Swift 3, they change the syntax a little bit. So you can represent any, any object that conforms to a UI table view delegate and UI table view data source. You can do this just fine. The problem with this right now is that it only works with concrete protocols in Swift 3. So no generic protocols, no generic types, and most importantly, no classes. So for those of us working with object-oriented frameworks for many years, this is a bit of a pain point. And of course, we can work around this with generics, because you, you can create a type constraint that is both a class and a protocol. The problem is sometimes those types end up getting bubbled up. And if you need it to be a property, well, then you're in like a whole heap of trouble. Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> it's not pretty. Um, but generics weren't actually meant to solve this problem. This is a known issue and a really big problem. And there's way more to do with existentials. 
And there's a lot of this that are going to be fixed in Swift 4. Um, there's even been activity as recent as last week on specifically fixing the class and protocol problem with existentials, but there's a much longer period of time that it's going to take to get the full uh, features of existential developed. But all of this is on the mailing list because Swift is evolving. We're still in the process of creating and vetting proposals for Swift 4. Um, and even stuff that isn't going to be in Swift 4 is being discussed already just because you know, they want to plan ahead. They want to make sure that this is a language that everyone loves to use. And so I'm just going to end with saying, if you think this stuff is cool, if you want to see some of these problems fixed, chime in on the mailing list. Swift is ours to see, to shepherd along and make it a great language for everyone to use. So the future is in your hands. Thank you.